This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. This is Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist. I live in Fayetteville, Arkansas and have done therapy there for the last 25 years or so. And I started Self Work in order to reach those of you who might be already interested in psychological and emotional issues, maybe even be in therapy yourself, or to those of you who've been initially diagnosed with depression or anxiety or having some relationship problems that just seem insurmountable and you're looking for answers, or actually I'm reaching out to a third group as well. Maybe those of you who'd never darken the door of a therapist, but you're looking around for answers and you're willing to listen to a podcast by someone like me. I wanted to extend the walls of my practice to all of you. So welcome to Self Work. Today we're going to be talking about telemental health. I ask lots of people about their experience and have some of the most recent research for you as well. I'd already investigated this because, as some of you know who've been regular listeners, BetterHelp is a sponsor of self-work and BetterHelp is an online therapy organization. But I dug into this even deeper because telemental health is being used exponentially more during this pandemic. You and your therapist, if you're using telemental health, can set it up for even better success, and I'll give you some tips how to do that. Our listener email today is from someone who feels very guilty that she's pulling away from an enmeshed relationship with her parents, where it was her job to act as a go-between. And although they made her life very comfortable and provided lots of valuable activities and experiences, it sounds like there was a price to pay. So please, all of you, sit back and relax. Some of you may actually be driving to work. I don't know. But sit back or relax wherever you are, and let's talk about telemental health. One of the initially stressful things about the outbreak of COVID-19 was what seemed to happen immediately due to the need for physical distancing, or at least what happened to therapy and therapists like me. Not every therapist moved their practice to telehealth, but many did, as insurance companies relaxed their standards of a therapist needing a telehealth certification to provide such and be in accord with their state licensing boards. So it took me the better part of three days to get a hold of all my patients and talk to them about whether or not they felt as if they wanted to move into that unknown or at least unattempted therapeutically space with me, the telehealth space. I'd been on Zoom some, certainly not as often as many corporate people had been, so I was a little nervous as well, not knowing if I would screw up the technical end of things. I quickly installed the professional version of Zoom, which is encrypted, meaning that hackers wouldn't be able to hack into anyone's session. That wasn't all that costly, but took some time as well. Mostly, I was concerned that my patients get the help, treatment, and support they needed at such a difficult time. And due to my own status as a high-risk person, given my age and medical history, I had to choose telehealth. Interestingly, I'd already taken one course on it, or (laughs) actually just half of it, so I was somewhat in the know. I stress the word somewhat. Mostly, it still felt very alien to me. I've always appreciated and tried to create a very warm, inviting atmosphere at my office. So how was I going to do that via my laptop? And how were each of my patients going to feel secure? There was a lot of work to do. In getting prepared for this podcast, however, I didn't want to rely solely on my own experience. I'd already done some research on telehealth when I was approached by BetterHelp as a sponsor for self-work. So I again reviewed that literature, and we're going to talk about that a bit. What do the studies show on telehealth results? Is it just as effective as in-person therapy? What I immediately noticed was the extremely wide range of services meant by the term telehealth. That could be seeing a psychiatrist. It could mean communication between a psychiatrist and a primary care doctor. It could be diagnostic assessment of different hard-to-reach populations, such as prisoners, people in rural areas or nursing homes, minorities where English is a second language and an interpreter is needed, 
In all of these situations, research done in 2013 showed that telehealth did great. As far as psychiatric needs go, or basically assignment of diagnoses and medication management, and very few psychiatrists these days actually do therapy. So what about therapy? There was a later study, a governmental study in 2017, indicated, and I'll read the conclusion to you, Telemental health care can provide effective and adaptable solutions to the care of mental illnesses universally. While being comparable to in-person services, telemental health care is particularly advantageous and inexpensive through the use of current technologies and adaptable designs, especially in isolated communities. Okay, so I forged ahead. I tend to kind of dive in the deep end of things anyway, or at least so I thought I was going to forge ahead, but certainly... That's what I did when I first began. After the first week of telehealth, even the first couple of days, I found myself so much more tired than I'd ever been after face-to-face meetings. So what was happening? I'd done Skype and Zoom interviews, no problem. But you have to know, I see six to eight people a day. And by six o'clock, my eyes were tired, my body was even more tired, and all of my senses felt like they were on overload. The good news is that it's gotten better as I learn more of the skill of listening and establishing what's called my own telepresence with my clients. We'll talk more about telepresence. But before we go on, BetterHelp, the sponsor of SelfWork, has a fantastic offer for you, and it's certainly apropos since we're talking about telemental health. Let's listen in. I was delighted when BetterHelp reached out to me as a potential sponsor. What exactly is BetterHelp? BetterHelp is an online therapy service that will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. It's not a crisis line. It's not really self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. I also tried this out, of course, for my self-work listeners, and I was very impressed with the two counselors I tried. There's a broad range of expertise, and you're actually matched to the therapist that they believe will work best for you. You can have video sessions, phone sessions, you can text, and actually it's much less expensive than quote-unquote normal therapy. And BetterHelp is rated number one by so many platforms that specialize in trying to help you find the best therapy online for you. There's a special offer for self-work listeners where you get 10% off your first month at trybetterhelp.com slash self-work. That's trybetterhelp, that's H-E-L-P dot com slash self-work. You can begin getting help today, and I highly recommend it. So give it a try. So what are the major issues with what you call it telemental health, telepsychology, telehealth? I found several articles talking about it, but one was especially succinct, and succinct is good for a podcast, and also might help those of you who are not necessarily doing therapy online, but are also just having multiple meetings a day on Zoom or some other platform. And there is a link to this particular article on Zoom fatigue is what it's called in your show notes. But here were their major points. First, we miss out on a lot of nonverbal communication. You know, we get information from our words, but feelings and attitudes are largely conveyed by nonverbal signals, facial expressions, the tone and pitch of someone's voice, their gestures, their posture, and actually just how they sit. In a face-to-face meeting, it's not too hard to process these cues pretty automatically. If someone looks out of the window a lot, you notice that, or their leg is pumping furiously during certain parts of the session. But on a video chat, a therapist needs to work harder to process nonverbal cues, or if it's just a meeting, you as a person need to work harder. Again, I'm quoting, Paying more attention to these consumes a lot of energy. Our minds are together when our bodies feel that we're not. That dissonance, which causes people to have conflicting feelings, is exhausting. So as a therapist especially, I tried to pay very close attention to those cues, and I was very tired, at least at first. The good news, things settle down, and you become accustomed to how telehealth works and how that dissonance, as they call it, can be transformed into something that you become more accustomed to. The article's second point, what if the kids run in? 
(laughs) You may fear judgment about your living space or where you're positioned to be on your computer. Maybe your house is a mess or you haven't made up your bed in a week. I myself very carefully positioned my camera to not show my unmade bed. (laughs) Here's what the article said on Zoom Fatigue. The physical environment acts as a cognitive scaffold. We attribute certain meanings to meeting rooms, and this subtly changes our behavior. This can include anchors to important topics, such as creativity and problem solving. When I took a recent telehealth certification course, they talked a lot about setting up expectations of privacy for therapy before it even begins. Now, setting this up in three days, I did not have time to do that. But actually, I haven't found that much distinction in how my own clients come to therapy. The ones that rushed in and didn't particularly care about their appearance in person-to-person therapy are about the same, where others have presented themselves very carefully in a very organized fashion. All of that is actually information, not good or bad, just information. And actually, I've had some pretty funny things happen as we're doing therapy, I've seen a lot of unusual spaces, closets, garages, storage sheds, but I can tell that where the patient is changes the way they speak. You know, maybe your closet is somewhere where you often sit and cry. Maybe you have a lot of arguments in your kitchen. So where you are can make a difference in just your overall attitude. And there have been lots of intrusions. I've seen a lot of kids, dogs, people have gotten cell phone calls, there have been notifications that are intrusive. So the way I've tried to address this is that my environment has stayed as consistent as possible. There have been no intrusions, and so on my end, you feel a calm coming from me. In fact, I set up the background very carefully so that it was as calming as I could make it. It wasn't my office, but I at least was trying to set up a consistent, peaceful environment. So if you're doing this, I would try to choose a place in your apartment or your home where you feel as calm as possible. The third point the Zoom fatigue article talked about is there are no water cooler catch-ups. The first few minutes of a meeting or a session are usually spent taking a little time to settle. Maybe in person-to-person therapy, time in the waiting room or on the trip to the office, that time has served as a place to kind of calm down, get your thoughts organized, and that's gone with telehealth. Often you've gone from one thing right into the other. So what I've been trying to do is have a couple of minutes of downtime to create that in my telehealth sessions. And you can ask your own therapist for just that, a couple of minutes to settle in and just breathe. This fourth point is one that I hear from everyone, including me. Looking at your own face is stressful. You bet this is hard. In fact, I changed from the galley view or where my client and I are side to side and moved to where I'm bigger to them and they're bigger to me, but I'm smaller and they're smaller to themselves, if that makes sense. You know, I've done a lot of Facebook Lives for the Mighty and some on my own Facebook page, and I certainly remember starting and I'm staring at myself and I would catch myself wanting to fix my bangs or fluff up my hair or it was very disconcerting. So I've had some experience with it before telehealth, which is good. But just to see oneself can also act as a stressor. You view your own negative facial expressions. You can see them and they actually intensify the emotions that you feel. And you add body image issues to that and it's really hard. But also there's room for discussion. I have one patient who refused to do video until the last session I saw her. She used it as a way to prepare for a meeting. She's gained some weight during this pandemic, and she's highly self-conscious about that. But you know what? If you're too uncomfortable, tell your therapist that for this session, you want the video off. That's fine. It'll be more like a phone call and actually may somewhat be easier for both of you to focus. Phone calls are easier. They don't give you the visual information, but in some ways, because it involves fewer of your senses, it's actually easier. But make sure you ask for what you need. The fifth point was, are you listening or are you frozen? Again, my course stressed that the therapist needs to know what to do technically in all situations, and you must have a backup communication like a cell phone. It's absolutely necessary. 
Because what if your client is talking about something very, very depressing and serious and all of a sudden the screen freezes or something happens and they go offline? This morning I had someone's cell phone get too hot in the car and it just stopped. Silence in real life conversation is important and creates a natural rhythm. But in a video call, silence can make you anxious about the technology. Has something gone wrong? Is there a delay between their speech and what their face looks like? It can be really disconcerting. And actually, the research shows that a person who's looking at someone frozen or with speech delay actually can see them as less interested or less friendly, which is obviously troublesome. But I've also found that silence may be therapeutically harder. It's one thing for me to wait in a person-to-person session until someone is ready to handle their emotions, but I'm there to hand them a Kleenex or I shift my position slightly to give them time to adjust. Often I'll find myself sitting forward in situations like that as a cue to give them permission to take the time they want and to let them know I'm even more focused. That's really not as easy with telehealth. So recognize that silence may be a little harder and talk about it together if you need to. And if there are too many technical interruptions, ask to switch to a phone call. And by the way, keep that Kleenex near at hand. But the good news is it's not all zoom and doom. It's actually great for people with social anxiety or even those with performance anxiety as well. So for some people who dread physical meetings, meeting online might be very welcome. But in order to understand more fully, and certainly from more than my own perceptions, I asked a bunch of people. I asked on my Instagram account and my Facebook closed group and on my professional Facebook page. So here are some of the responses I received. And actually, their comments and reactions are very similar to what you'll find in the research, just more personal. I heard from both therapists and people who have been seen through telehealth. So I divided them into three groups, very positive, very negative, and mm, not sure. Let's hear first from the very positive. As a client, I have benefited from it because I'm not always able to drive to an appointment, and we can't afford a second vehicle. It's ableist and classist to expect clients to always be able to come to the therapist. It's also more time efficient. I spent an hour commuting back and forth, plus getting settled and greeting and then getting ready to go. Those small rituals add up to 10 minutes of time. This sounds like someone who's very time conscious. I had to smile at this. Here's another comment. Safety. I love it. No traffic, no touching door handles, no need for a sitter or to check their baby daddy work schedule. It's the best. And here's a third. My surprise was that it wasn't impersonal at all. In fact, my providers, and I've used three different providers, were very focused on me. There were no distractions and it felt less clinical. I could clearly tell I was their 100% focus. And here's the last positive statement. I actually love telehealth. I'm more comfortable and open. I'm less anxious waiting in the virtual rating room. I don't feel bad for not giving much eye contact because I'm in the comfort of my own home. Here are positives from therapists. I'm studying homeopathy, and I see a homeopath myself, and telehealth makes it so easy. We were able to work with anyone in the world with an internet connection. Now, I should say that most psychologists in most states cannot do this. For example, in Arkansas, I can only work with people who reside in Arkansas. But people like life coaches and homeopathic practitioners can have that freedom. Here's another positive from a therapist. It's incredible with established providers. As a provider myself, we had way better compliance with patients, especially our Medicaid patients who don't need to rely on public transport anymore. Another Love it. I launched the telehealth program at the community mental health center where I work. It takes some getting used to, but then it feels very natural. Also, lots of research showing great data that telehealth versus in-office sessions have the same treatment outcomes. But here are some negative complaints. I was offered telehealth but declined. Just the thought of going this route made me very anxious back in March. Thankfully, I have done well through this pandemic. I would not have felt comfortable in my home with this manner of counseling and was not keen on sitting in my car. Here's another. I did weekly phone calls. They worked, but they weren't the same. I honestly think that some things get lost over the phone. I think it was our second phone visit, and she told me I sounded good. I really hadn't had a good week, but it was so easy to agree over the phone. And here's the last. 
I don't like telehealth. I don't have a private space when my family is home to ensure they won't listen or interrupt. When I'm home by myself, it's fine, but it's just not the same. And I feel it's harder to open up via telehealth for some reason. I had to laugh with one patient, her 17-year-old daughter, she found on the other side of the door <laughs> trying to listen to her therapy session. I thought, you know, when I was 17, I'd probably want to hear my mother's therapy session as well. Here's just a couple of small negatives from therapists. I do telehealth with youth, and I feel it's so hard to make a connection with them over video. There really weren't too many negatives, but I think even some of the things that patients talked about are true for therapists as well. So let's talk to the mm, not sure people. Here's some clients. I have to say I feel a lot more free to be more open over the computer. That being said, I'm also easily distracted, especially with the fur kids wanting everyone to know they're here. And another, for me it was better than not having a session at all, but it was difficult because it made me insecure about being silent for a moment, and it felt like a lot of communication got lost on the way. The physical presence of my therapist always calms me and makes it easier to face difficult emotions. This is lost during a telesession. Here's one more. Personally, if given the choice, I would rather go in person than have telehealth sessions, but telehealth is better than not having therapy at all. And don't get me wrong, not having to sit in bumper-to-bumper traffic several times a week is nice. One more. While it's been effective, I do miss connecting with a human. And here's the last. It has had advantages and disadvantages. It's been easier to get an appointment in after work because I don't have to worry about the commute to the clinic. But the disadvantage has been trying to find a quiet, private place. I personally cannot have a session at home because therapy is frowned upon in my family. That's a huge point. So many people I see, their families don't know they're coming. So if you're a therapist doing telehealth, I think there are a lot of ways to demonstrate caring over the screen. Your tone of voice, the warmth and response to the emotions conveyed, and more than anything, listening intently and being tuned in. You have to, for example, to have good telepresence, not necessarily look strictly at the screen, but look at where the recording is actually taking place. That makes your gaze much more direct, and you have to develop the ability to look at that light and also know what your patient is doing at the same time. But just so we're clear, I heard a story this week about a therapist, an in-person session, who was taking off her shoes and picking at her feet during sessions, and it mostly felt like chit-chat. So even in-person therapy can be really inappropriate. So wherever you get your therapy, it's important that you feel listened to and understood. That is paramount. And in these days and times, It's also, obviously, about keeping safe, both physically and emotionally. So I think telehealth is probably here to stay. And for those who want to switch back to in-person therapy, hopefully that will be available soon. And some therapists are moving back into in-person work. Our listener today is from someone who has grown up with a very enmeshed relationship with her parents. And I certainly did that with my mom. So I know this listener's feelings very well. Let's hear her out. Thank you for your article about enmeshed relationships. I definitely had an enmeshed relationship with my father. And I appreciate what you said, which is that, you know, I do feel a lot of guilt about the way my anger towards both my parents, because they were really by all outward means, like really great parents. Like they took me on great vacations, paid for a lot of really great extracurricular activities. I would go hiking on my birthday with my dad. That was what I wanted to do every birthday. You know, it was just him and I. And later my mom, when they started to have problems, would overshare details about their finances, like refinancing the house, specific debts, And I felt like they both depended on me to be the peacemaker, even when I was very, very young. And like now, I'm just tired of that role, and I'm wanting some space, and I'm really angry about it, actually, and I do feel guilt about that. But I appreciate you talking about that guilt, because it's very real. Thank you. I will say that my posts on enmeshment are some of the most read posts on my blog, and I will have them featured in the show notes. 
This listener is certainly thanking me for giving her permission, something her parents aren't doing, to move away from the exhausting and pseudo-adult role she played with her parents, that of mediator and counselor. Enmeshment is a very difficult relationship to see because it looks or seems so great. A parent or parents are there for you, provide for you, so your problems are far different than abuse or neglect, and you can even feel shame for even wondering if there's something wrong. But children aren't supposed to play adult roles with their parents, not even psychological ones. It is a job that you'll never succeed in. First, you don't have the power to make a parent happy, but you're told, I don't know what I'd do without you, or I know I'm not supposed to count on you, but you simply understand me better than your dad or your mom, whatever. At the same time, you feel very special. You also feel loaded down with the emotional burden of trying to fix a parent, and actually, You will never fix them. It's also made more complicated by others telling you what great parents you have. I do wonder about this woman's story. If her wanting to spend every birthday with her dad has something to do with enmeshment, maybe not. But I know that my mom was quite jealous of time I spent with my dad, and I didn't spend too much of it. So I longed to be with him. Obviously, I don't know, but I'd wonder. I always recommend Dr. Pat Love's book, The Emotional Incest Syndrome. It will open your eyes for sure to this problem. And it's definitely a book I'd highly recommend. But know that many people who were abused or neglected are not going to understand your particular problem. And so you have to sift through your feelings with a therapist who does understand. Thank you so much for joining me today on Self Work. I know this is a very strange time for so many of us, full of change and transition, and I appreciate you making Self Work a part of your day. I want you to know that Chartable, which is a ranking system, had Self Work number 30 in the lineup of mental health podcasts in the United States, and I could not be more grateful to those of you who come here every week and send your friends and are making self-work happen. So thank you. There are lots of ways of getting in touch with me. My email is askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. My website, where a lot of people are subscribing, is a really easy way of getting my weekly blog post as well as this podcast. Just subscribe. You'll get a book, The Seven Commandments of Good Therapy, which is an ebook that I wrote several years ago. But that website is drmargaretrutherford.com. I do have a book that's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and at your bookstore. It was published by New Harbinger. It's called Perfectly Hidden Depression How to Break Free from the Perfectionism That Masks Your Depression. I'm passionate about this topic, and I've done a lot of podcasts on it. You can listen to podcast actually number three if you're curious about what exactly it is. But it's when perfectionism and a perfect looking life masks or hides or serves as a cloak for a depression that doesn't look like classic depression but it's hiding there underneath. And the feelings associated with that depression, with that loneliness and despair, can grow extremely potent. So I hope if this applies to you, that you'll get a copy of the audiobook, the ebook, or of course, the paperback. You can also have greater access to me if you join my Facebook group. It's a closed group, facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. That's facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode, and give it a try. Take very good care. This is Dr. Margaret, and you've been listening to Self Work.